Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing Oki Mark in the 15 minute pool on ICC. This player is rated 2038, and let me check their stats. Hmm, they haven't played much 15 minute rec recently. Peak rating of 2059, 44 wins, 16 losses. So I'm opening with d4, they play knight f6, and let's play some main line. Met my peak 15 minute rating. Been doing very well in this category recently. It's actually hard to remember a game I've lost. I don't want to jinx myself, but <laughs> it's been going well. So bishop g7, let's play e4. We're heading into a king's Indian. And let's play a Samish variation, f3. This is a line I like from the white side. As of late, I have not had some uh, great successes against higher rated players in this line, but for the most part, it's it's good for white and I know it quite well, so I'll continue to play it. Black is setting up the piano variation with knight c6, and the idea is rook b8 followed by b5 pushing on the queen side. I'll play queen d2, and after rook b8, there's a big split on move nine. White has a bunch of options. Rook c1 and knight c1 are both major moves at white's disposal, but you can also get aggressive and play, for instance, on the king side, you can play g4 or h4. I'll probably stick to rook c1 or knight c1. Rook b1 is also an interesting move idea being to push b4. So after rook b1, b5, c takes b5, a takes b5, and then play b4. But rook c1 and knight c1 will probably be the choice, one of those two moves. Rook c1 is more enterprising. Let's do that. After knight c1, black has the option to go e5, d5, and then knight d4, which I'll show in the analysis after this game. Whereas here, that isn't working for black because I have d4 well protected. So bishop d7, flexible move. The idea of rook c1, by the way, is so that if black had played b5 on the last move, I could take and then play knight takes b5, winning a pawn because of the loose knight on c6. Here I'll go knight d1. This is a standard maneuver. White intends to put the knight on f2. Moreover, if black plays b5, I will play c5 in advance past. Which is usually how black plays now. They can also play e5, d5, and then knight e7. I've had a couple games go like that. We'll see how Oki Mark plays. Plays e5. All right, so we're advancing and playing d5. Knight e7. So I recall a game where I had this position from the white side, a tournament game, and I played knight f2 and continued with g3, bishop g2, and castle short. In that game, my opponent played for c5 and tried to clamp the queen side. So I'm wondering if I could play c5 myself, or if that's premature. I think I'll play knight f2. Hmm. Or g3 right away. Because knight f2 doesn't exactly help white immediately, whereas we know we have to fianchetto this bishop and castle, or develop this bishop and castle. So playing g3, bishop g2 might be more constructive in the short term. Whereas knight f2, I mean, it reinforces some points like e4 and g4 and whatnot, but it's not mandatory. Okay, let's play g3. Sometimes that's how you make decisions at the outset of a chess game. You figure out which moves are mandatory for you and which ones are more dispensable that you can potentially do without. And you should usually prioritize the moves that you think are necessary to your setup or plan. Knight e8, so black is preparing f5. I'll play bishop g2 all the same. And after f5, probably I'll play knight f2 then, because I want to castle. But if f5 and then I castle immediately, black can play f takes e4, f takes e4, rook takes f1, and swap a pair of rooks down the file. 
And I'd like to keep black cramped. I have a space advantage right now due to this pawn on d5, and I'd like to keep black cramped. And in cramping your opponent, it's key to avoid unnecessary trades. If black plays b5 now, by the way, I'll play c5. I'll push past. I won't open the c file. It's better to continue pushing on the queen side and gain more space with the pawns. I like this guy's finger note. His first finger note says, chess is a great unsolved mathematical problem. Yes, it is. There are a finite number of moves in chess. Hence, there has to be a quote-unquote solution to the game. But it's such a complex math problem that we have no capabilities to solve it at present. <laughs> Which is a very good thing, if you ask me. So f5 and I'll go here. It's hard for black to arrange f4. I have four pieces on that square guarding it. I think this is how my previous game in this line went. They at some point played c5, if I recall, but black did something very similar on the king side first. So I can castle. I can also play that c5 move. But you know what? If I play c5, I have to reckon with bishop b5. They can get their bishop outside the chain and try to attack my knight on e2. So I think for now I'm content simply to complete my development. And I'll try to work this slight space advantage that I have. Time-wise, the game is proceeding normally, I'd say. No one's spending too much or too little time. The last game I played against Viper Boy, my opponent used hardly any time and was just blitzing out the moves, which is a huge sin in these 15-minute games. I'll be curious to see where Black plays in this one, because they have options to play on either wing. Usually in a King's Indian, it's better for Black to play on the King side. That's typically where their counterplay lies, but here it's a bit different. You can see how well entrenched I am on the King side. I have plenty of pieces to assist in the defense of my king, so I wouldn't be surprised for black to, to see black switching back over to the queen side, which is traditionally white's domain. I mentioned what would happen if b5, I would play c5. If they play c5, trying to influence the center, you know, grab control over d4, grab control over b4, and maybe then play b5, I do have the option of taking up Assange. So c5, d takes c6, and let's say bishop takes c6, so that black's queen defends the d6 pawn. I don't know if I would take that option, though, because I could play rook f d1, attacking d6 further, but I don't like that black bishop sitting on c6, attacking my pawn on e4. So black plays knight h5. Looks like they may play on the king side. f4 is still not a threat. I'm tempted to go ahead and play c5, but there is that bishop b5 move as soon as I do that. Bishop g5 is possible, pinning the knight on e7. I fear my bishop isn't doing a whole lot more, though. That would be kind of an annoyance move, just to try to mess with black's position a bit. There's no grand plan attached to bishop g5. Maybe I could play bishop g5 and then at some point take on f5, which right now is not attractive because black can take with the knight. Hmm. Knight d3 is possible. That would allow a capture on e4 and possible trades down the file. b4 is a generic move just to gain space on the queen side, also rolls out c5. b4 might not be a bad play while I await future developments on the king side. Gets a pawn off this long diagonal, so if something opens up, black's bishop wouldn't be hitting this pawn on b2. 
That four is still not playable for black. G takes F, E takes F, Knight takes. And I just want a clean pawn. Could also play some preparatory move to guard against bishop b5, but it's kind of tough because a4 is not possible. It just hangs a pawn to bishop takes a4. I could play something like rook fd1 so that after c5, the bishop is not in line with my rook. Maybe that's the way to go. Rook fd1. Could also play rook c2 and maybe get ready to double up on the c file. If I'm going to break through on that file eventually, maybe I should do that. Rook c2. Still, they could play that c5 move. But I somehow think it's less likely now that they played knight h5 that they'll do that. Rook c2 could be more useful than b4, though. I'm not sure b4 really helps me much. Okay, let's try rook c2. I'm intrigued by this possibility. We're digging in. It's kind of trench warfare right now. I'm trying to train the big big guns on Black's C file and my C file as well. So that after C5, I can invade C5, C takes D6, C takes D6, and an eventual rook C7. And this should be a clear signal to Black that I intend to push C5 and break through on this wing eventually. They could try to play b6 to slow me down, but b4 would renew the threat. That's when I think b4 would become a useful move. Possibly more useful than it is right now. I'm curious how they'll follow up knight h5. It seems like a move that black wants to uh, use to prepare f4, but they need more firepower down the f-file. They need something like queen e8 to f7. If the immediate queen e8 is played, I might just play c5 directly and just allow bishop b5, but then take on d6 and maybe double up my rooks then. Although then they could capture on e2 and push f4. So it's possible I'll have to give some respect to the f4 push. Queen e8 is probably what I would do here as black. Maybe I could at some point play... Let's say queen e8, rook fc1, queen f7, and then maybe a move like knight h3, trying to go knight g5 and harass that queen. That could be a good solution. Knight h3 also helps in stopping f4. Let's see how deeply black thinks here because they want to avoid the trap of getting too low on time. I've liked their time management up through this point, but I feel like they're going to spend quite a bit of time on their next few moves. If c5, I'll probably take en passant and then play rook d1. Rook f7. Okay, I think black is going for queen f8. So that's along the same lines as that idea of queen e8, queen f7. Now, do I play rook fc1? If knight h3 immediately, I don't like the fact that they can take on e4. So I think I should vacate the f file first, strangely enough, so that I can later play uh, knight h3, a move from now. So rook fc1, then let's say queen f8, knight h3. If f4 then g takes f4, let's say bishop takes h3, bishop takes h3. They can take on f4, it's safe then, but I have this bishop coming to e6 that looks pretty nasty for black. I don't think they should allow that. Okay, let's do this. It looks like I'm abandoning my king, but I think it's going to be very tough for them to get through down the f-file. So that's why I'm okay with doing this. 
And I believe after queen f8 that this knight h3 move is going to pester them quite a bit. I guess they can play h6 in doing this, though. That's one detail I didn't consider too closely. Like if knight h3 just play h6 and deny my knight the use of the g5 square, that's not the end of the world, though. My knight still holds up the f4 advance, which is kind of the key. Yeah, okay, so let's do that. The knight could have gone to d3 as well. But I like the idea of being within shouting distance of the g5 square, and it might induce them to play h6 and slow down. If they had chosen the arrangement that I originally suggested with the queen coming to f7 and the rook on f8, then h6 would not be possible. I would just be taking that pawn. So black does play h6. Now c5, that's the consistent move. c5 is the way to go if we want to keep pushing in the middle. If c5, f4, g takes f4, bishop takes h3, bishop takes h3. That works out similarly, though. All right, let's, let's do this. c5. All the preparations have been made. It's go time. A classic battle of opposing pawn pushes. That's what you're seeing right here. Such a typical theme in the King's Indian. I have noticed that many King's Indian players feel less comfortable when they're not uh, easily able to attack the White King. Not saying that's necessarily the case here, but that's one reason to choose a line like the Samish, where White plays f3 on move 5. Traditionally, it's pretty difficult for Black to get at White's King in this one. And white often even castles queenside. So black plays this move that I thought they might play, but I don't know that it really has the same effect now. So now I'm thinking of just trading on d6 and then invading down the c file, rook c7, and kind of pinning them on the seventh rank. I very much like the fact that black's bishop on d7 will no longer be pointed at my knight on h3. That makes me feel safer. Okay, so let's take, I think this exchange is almost automatic. I have to open the file. Now, if I play rook c7, I'll look at either f takes e4 or f4. In both cases, I think we're doing fine. I could play knight c3 here, attacking the bishop, but that would block my play down the file. So rook c7 would be the most consistent. Yeah, let's invade. Wow, and black just immediately takes on e2. I'm surprised by that. I think they really want to arrange f4. But I don't know that it's going to have the same effect now. Giving up that light square bishop is a big decision for black. So here I don't even have to take necessarily. I could play bishop f2. Bishop f2 takes away squares from this knight, but maybe decent. But if I take, so g takes f4 e takes f4, maybe I play bishop a7 then, and then bring the knight back to f2. Although g takes f4, e takes f4, bishop a7, rook e8 threatens knight takes d5, which is kind of sneaky. I'm going to take, though. I think trading is in my best interest versus bishop f2. I really would have hated to have to play bishop f2. Hmm. So bishop a7, rook e8, maybe queen c2 then? Triple up on the c-file? Looks pretty good to me. I'll do that. Black's already playing very quickly. They're in hustle mode, as I would say. Okay, knight f2 is planned. Introducing bishop h3 options. What do I take on c8 first? If I take on c8, black's going to take with a knight and attack my bishop. It slows me down a little bit. Yeah, hence, let's get this knight back in the, in the game. That was my worst place piece. So I want to do this and 
In doing so, prepare bishop h3. Bishop h3 with the bishop potentially coming into e6 is going to be a huge headache for black. Let's pre-move this capture. I have a couple loose pieces. This is true on the 7th rank, especially this bishop on a7. I'm going to have to watch that piece. But maybe it's okay. Ooh, actually... Hmm. Now that I'm looking at it, if they take and then play knight c8, what would I do there? I'd have to play rook takes f7, followed by bishop b8, which looks kind of odd. Fortunately, they didn't play it, but maybe that would have been decent for them. Okay, what about knight d3 now? That gives my bishop f2 always. I can still play bishop h3 whenever I want. Bishop h3 is so good, though. That's just like a straight up good move. Bishop h3, rook takes c7, rook takes c7. Bishop e6 is coming so quick. That can make up for that loose piece. Yeah, let's do it. I'll keep this knight flexible. Maybe it wants to come to d3. Maybe it wants to go to g4. We'll see. Now I'm expecting black to play a king move, because I think they want to get out of the potential bishop e6 idea. Maybe they'll play knight g7, but I think a king move would be more natural. If knight g7, knight g4 looks strong, attacking the bishop and also hitting h6. But if they move their king to like the 7th rank, like g7 or h7, bishop e6, and if this rook has to move again, they're pretty vulnerable on that 7th rank. Hmm. So this allows bishop e6, queen takes a7, rook takes e7. And that, that rook on f7 is just dropping, is it not? So maybe I don't even have to waste time moving my dark square bishop back. I don't think I do. Yeah. Well, let's just bring this guy in. Black instantly takes, but what do you do about this? That's a full rook. They can't even stop. Rook takes f7. Yeah, something like that is kind of expected, I guess. So they're hoping for take, f takes, and then pressure against f2, but I don't have to take that if I don't want to. Queen c4 is probably a good move. Threatening queen c8. Yeah, they're kind of stuck here. Queen c4, queen e3, just making sure that that doesn't hurt me. Queen c8 check, followed by mate shortly, I believe. Uh, close to it. Yeah, let's do that. So we're going to leave this knight to its own devices, but that knight on g3 is just sitting there pretty uselessly. I think black has to try queen e3 now, but yeah, black just resigned. It's pretty hopeless. Okay, so let's go back and look at this one. I get the impression that black panicked a bit too early in the middle game. Maybe they saw that we were approaching blitz speed and started trying to compensate for that by playing fast, but they, they made some tactical errors there. So... Yes, and the same as white plays f3 and then later brings the bishop to e3. And you can do bishop e3 either on move 6 or 7. I actually like playing knight ge2 because I find it more flexible. In some cases, the bishop will go to g5 in this line. But bishop e3 is the more popular move. Knight ge2 is just kind of a specialty line that I play. So a6, you also see c5 a lot. And if you follow my 15-minute games, you've seen opponents play e5 here as well. But a6, black intends to enforce this b5 move, which black never did in this game, but it's a big plan for them. Queen d2 and rook b8. So now b5 is on the cards, and white's next move is usually directed against that. So rook c1, like I played, or knight c1 is played often, where the bishop participates in defending against b5. 
But with knight c1, the thing is black can play this e5 move I mentioned. And then after d5, they can jump the knight into d4. Point being that after bishop takes d4, pawn takes d4, queen takes d4, black has a tactical shot here to at least win the material back and even get a much better position. And if you want to pause your video and find that, you can. Black to move. Okay, so white has parted with the dark square bishop, so that should make us a little skeptical. Look how many pawns we have on light squares. Our dark squares are weak. And black can play knight takes e4 here, which takes advantage of that. Unleashing the dark square bishop, attacking the queen. And if queen takes e4, you probably saw that black has rook e8, pinning white down the e-file. Disastrous. So that's one reason I kind of don't like knight c1. White usually plays knight e2 or knight b3 in this case. They, you can go right back to e2 and try to knock out that knight. But um, I've had slightly better results with rook c1. And as I also mentioned, white can start getting frisky on the king side too if they like g4. And there's even rook b1 I also talked about where a pawn after b5, you try to do this and slow down the b pawn. You try to prove that it's a target later in the game. Flexible position for white on move 9. So many options. So now if black were to play b5, I can trade and then play knight takes b5. And the white rook is attacking c6. I caught an international master in this one time. It was a blitz game, but it shows that um, sometimes black even falls for that. But my opponent played bishop d7, which renews the threat of b5. And now I played this rather strange looking maneuver if you're not used to this line, knight d1. But the point is, is that b5 will be met by c5. And should black take, I'm intending to take with the rook now to keep this central dominance, this pawn duo, d4, e4 intact. So black played e5, I went d5, knight e7, and then g3. I was debating a little bit about whether to play knight f2 or whether to play c5. Let's start at the engine right here. The engine thinks knight f2. It may not make a huge difference. I have seen a couple games where white tries to develop the bishop to e2 or d3. So they might try to move this knight. But the thing is, if white plays knight g3, in my eyes, that encourages f5. Because then f5 will come with the threat of f4, forking the bishop and the knight. So on the whole, I think it's probably better to keep this knight here. So g3, black played knight e8, and prepared traditional counterplay with f5. I played knight f2. Normal stuff, these last few moves. So let's say black had played c5 right around here. I'm just curious how the game would go, because I mentioned the possibility of taking en passant. And after bishop takes, maybe going here and trying to line up on the d6 pawn, but I think black has some nice activity, like this bishop has been improved. The computer seems to like white quite a bit though. f takes e4, f takes e4, bishop d7, that seems odd. Maybe it's because if black plays a defensive move like knight e8, that allows c5. So if black tries to guard that, I can push the c pawn, and I'm on d6 three times now, pawn, rook, and queen. And d5 is not possible, I just take it and my bishop is backing up the pawn as well. So at this point, there might be just a concrete reason why c5 isn't as good. So if c5 and I took en passant, then black could play b takes, counterattacking the b2 pawn. And the engine says that's fine, just go for this as white. Attacking the knight, knight c3. And it still gives a hefty advantage to white. Yeah, I could see that. My rook is coming to d1 to harass the bishop on d7. This bishop is, or this rook rather, is undefended. Maybe something like queen a3 attacking the rook and also the a6 pawn could be coming up. So it seems even in this case white is achieving excellent play. So as played, black focused on the queen side, or on the king side rather. Knight h5 and I just played rook c2. Hard to say what the best move is here. I spent some time on this move, didn't I? Yeah, about three minutes. So if I play c5 directly, I just thought black would do this. I'd like to play c5 at a moment when I'm immediately crashing through on the c-file on c takes d6. But after c takes d6 here, I just don't quite have the firepower to come into the c7 square. So that's why I like this preparatory move rook c2. 
I also thought about B4, but I was worried that B4 would prove to be unnecessary. Because after C5, it's not like black is going to take my pawn and allow me to take with the B pawn. They're going to keep their structure intact and wait for me to take on D6. And since it, it'd be difficult to believe that I could play B5 anytime soon, I just I worry that this move isn't as useful as a move like Rook C2 getting ready to double. So here, Rook F7. That was kind of a creative maneuver, Rook F7 and Queen F8. Seems to me black is just worse here. It looks like my play is more likely to crash through than black's kingside play, their kingside pawn storm. So I'm just so well entrenched to meet that f4 or f takes e4 plan. So rook f7, I doubled up. And if b6 is played, I was going to go b4 and prepare this. Now b4 actually has a purpose, supporting the c5 advance. So black stuck to their guns with queen f8. Knight h3. This move is debatable. Maybe I don't even need it. I thought it could be a good idea to at least threaten knight g5 and I get another piece defending against f4. But there's no denying that in the long run my knight would prefer to be on a different square than h3. h3 is not exactly uh, the ideal square for that piece. Knights on the rim are dim, right? I could have played knight d3 if I wanted that protection over f4. But knight h3 at least wins a tempo. The engine says don't worry about a thing and just play c5. Hmm. And if f4, g takes, knight takes, take d6, take d6, trade, and then play bishop in. This is sort of like the game, except my knight didn't take a detour to h3. I get the sense knight h3 isn't bad, but it's probably not the best move too. Yeah, probably just directly playing on the queen side would be stronger. So h6, and then c5, bishop b5, I take on d6, black took back, and I invaded rook to c7. I think starting here is where black played suspiciously. Their position is worse, but it's not losing by any means. But decisions like bishop takes e2, and then especially playing rook c8 here, Maybe that move is not so bad. We'll see that coming up. But I thought rook e8 was better because it would threaten knight takes d5. Maybe this won't help black's cause, but we'll find out. For black and a king's Indian, though, giving up the light square bishop is always a big decision. I know in this case they may have already committed themselves to that plan by playing bishop b5 and taking aim at this knight. But you saw the consequence of giving up that, that bishop in the game. That e6 square became weak. So I started to feel right here that I had a big advantage and that if I could quell Black's play on the king side, I'll probably win because on the queen side, I've already made significant strides. So Black played f4 as planned. Knight took. I thought about bishop f2, but I didn't like that that took away the square from my knight. That's why I ultimately rejected that move. But I do have to say, coming up, my bishop on a7 may have been less stable than I originally thought. Because here I played knight f2, which took away the safest retreat square for that piece. So you can see I have like a, a traffic jam between this dark square bishop and the knight, which is ironic because they're on totally opposite sides of the board right now, about a far, as far away as you can get from each other. <laughs> but because that bishop's a long range piece, it still needs a retreat square. So I didn't have a lot of time to calculate this, but I was wondering what would happen here if rook takes c7, rook takes c7, knight c8. Point being that black is attacking my bishop, and look at all the squares that are unavailable for the bishop. Every retreat square is unavailable to that piece. Black controls d4 with their bishop, e3 is controlled by that f4 pawn, c5 is controlled by the d6 pawn, and black's newly positioned knight here controls b6 and it's attacking. So I thought I'd have to play this, and then regardless of which way black captures, like let's say queen takes, then play bishop b8. That's an unusual square for the bishop, but at least here it attacks the d6 pawn, so black's knight can't move, and it's not easy for black to attack the bishop. Maybe king takes f7 would be stronger, but I'd still play bishop b8. And yeah, the engine thinks I can survive this. 
So I wish I would have actually looked at this line a little closer when I played knight f2, because that might have influenced my decision whether or not to play that. I might have opted for rook takes c8 and then just dropping the bishop back here, which would have felt somewhat like a defeat because I was trying to avoid that and instead put the knight on f2, but maybe this keeps my advantage nonetheless, as you can see. So that was a, a good chance by black, at least, to take on c7 and then try to play knight c8. But I think bishop e5, while well, that move stabilizes f4, and it looks nice, it kind of solidifies black's position, that's not helping their cause at all. And after bishop h3, the weakness of the e6 square becomes readily apparent. And I'm attacking the rook, so black takes. Yeah, now just the threat of bishop e6 and possibly my knight jumping into g4, d3 is winning the game for me, I believe. I didn't see a viable defense for black. They quickly played this move, but bishop e6. Yeah, that seems to be best. Let black take and then take on e7, and this rook is a goner. If we back up a few moves, I'm not sure black even has a decent defense. I was speculating that I thought the king should move. So the engine suggests king h7. And then knight d3, just playing the position slowly. Yeah, our bishops have such free reign on these diagonals, don't they? And black's knights, on the other hand, don't have good squares that they can occupy. Here, one threat could be taking on e5, playing bishop e6, and then going for pawn d6. So hence why I think the engine wants to drop the bishop back. And then queen f2, okay, yeah. And you're noticing that this b7 pawn is hanging at, at every moment, practically. Queen f2 maybe prepares bishop d4 or a possible invasion into b6. I think this plus three assessment that you're seeing isn't reflecting how bad black's position is uh, immediately. Like, they're not going to lose material just right away, but it's reflecting the immense long-term advantages that white has. The two bishops and black having no play is probably going to lead to a collapse in, you know, less than 10 moves for black. There's so many ways I can probe them. I can play bishop e6. I can win the queen side. I can bring my queen in. This knight will probably do some damage. I can maybe play for e5 even. That's yeah, probably too much. I would probably have played bishop e6 somewhere here had this position occurred just to force rook g7. And then, I don't know, maybe even just win a pawn, take here. I guess I have to watch out for some tactical shots, maybe. It seems hard to believe, but... Huh. Yeah, if I take Black's Rook here, they can Check. take with the Queen, and then they're on my Bishop. So I might have to watch out for some tactics. And if Bishop takes d5, I assume the idea is to take and then play the Queen somewhere on the 7th rank to skewer these two Bishops. Ob objectively, Black's position should be lost, though. So I think they missed their chance right around here. It's, it's a tough position to defend, but it's not yet lost. I think their biggest chance was playing rook takes c8 and then knight c8. I'm trying to embarrass this bishop, make it go to b8. But as played, I got everything I wanted. Queen a8. I brought this here. Knight g7 is objectively the best move, but still Check. bad after just grabbing the exchange. And then bishop b6. Yeah, black has nothing to show for the exchange. Note that I could play rook takes e7 here, but that does allow knight takes e6. Even this is probably still good. Especially since I would check on e6, but I probably would have captured on f7 instead. So take, rook takes, knight g3. And I think I made their call, the right call here, not even taking. I mean, this, this is probably winning as well, I'm sure. Rook takes f7, but there's no reason to give them that play on the knight on f2. Black's knight is not hurting anyone on g3, so... I just played this, introducing queen c8 as a threat and keeping the pin. I thought maybe black would play queen e3, but I figured Check. it was probably going to be force mate or close to it. Check. Take here, black would have to block with the bishop. Check. And it looks like I do have a force mate. Let me try to work this out, actually. I'm going to switch off the engine for now. So after king takes g7, queen g8 check, king f6. Now, how do I keep that king contained? Probably queen d8 check. 
so that if king e5, we have queen h8 checkmate. It's a cool checkmate. And if um, queen d8 check, no, they can't go to g5 because my queen controls that square. So king back to g7. And then it'll be just queen e7, king h8, queen f8, king h7, queen g8 checkmate. So black never gets a chance to play queen e1. So this is the line Check. I was calculating. There might be a faster way too, but Check. this is clear cut to me. Yeah, and if king e5, Checkmate. that is mate in the center of the board. And if Check. king g7, Check. I was saying this line. Check. Checkmate. So, yeah, that looks to be the case. So, they just gave it up right here. Okay, well, I think Black played okay. Um, I think this is actually a pretty illustrative game for this line and how the piano variation might go should you have to play this. And Rook C1 is a good move on move 9. You can experiment with other moves if you like the system. I think black was doing all right. Maybe they should have been more open to the idea of playing on the queen side at some point. They kind of put all their eggs in one basket and went all in on the king side. But after c5 here on move number 19, looks like white's just getting there faster. Although the lack of coordination between my dark square bishop and the knight right around where I played bishop a7 could have been significant had they noticed this uh, knight c8 idea. Rook takes c7, rook takes c7, knight c8. All right, hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll be back again tomorrow with another one. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.